To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we have a special guest. Um, After the Charlie Taylor episode I did a while ago, I really realized that there's a class of anglers that no one knows about, and that's an injustice to this area. There are a bunch of really good sticks that are just, they're just local sticks that, that are good and, and they deserve some recognition. And to be able to just talk about this area and kind of like their story. And that's what I really want this platform to be is it's about just the local anglers and our local bodies of water. And I have the pleasure of having on Todd Langford. Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Um, and we're, we're talking a little bit before the show started and hopefully I can get a little bit more now is what got you into this? Well, I, uh, I, I learned to fish down in Southwest Virginia. I'm from Smith mountain Lake. And, uh, some of the guys that taught me to fish were some of the very first members of, of bass. And I was always kind of fascinated by, you know, that world and, uh, you know, just, uh, kind of growing up around Smith mountain Lake, just seeing the guys in bass boats and, you know, just sort of learning on my own a little bit, um, just sort of naturally got into it, I guess, but it's a, it's a long way away from a a cricket and a bobber. I promise you. (laughs) (laughs) So, so when, when did, what, tournament series did you start actually fishing first because uh, when we we're talking beforehand you're talking about the Bassmaster weekend series and i literally have never heard of that until you brought it up yeah i mean if you if you go back to the very beginning with me there was a, a group called uh, small waters bass club i don't really know if they're around anymore and then it was the fountainhead uh bass masters um I'm oh sure wow you, you know you've, you've, you've heard of, you've heard of those guys and uh there's a bunch of us that kind of i wouldn't say graduated from fountainhead but you know, we just, you know, you get a big boat, you know, and you have family, you don't really have time to fish 9,000 events anymore. And I just kind of focus on the the bigger events at this point. How many events do you fish right now? Um, I probably fish 30 a year, I would say damn. something like that. That's actually, damn, that's a lot. And then guys, just for a, li- a little quick recap of some stats, because I-, I thought this was kind of kind of cool uh, from, from the M- MLF or old FLW side of things, you know, total events, fish 58 top tens. He's got 13 career wins, three winnings is over thirty two thousand um, dollars. And then also you said like you, you've probably done probably a little bit better on just the local scene, too. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, success comes and goes you know, it's, it's very competitive. <laughs> mm. Um, the, the weekend series, you know, that nobody really, I mean, guys still fish it. It's not called the weekend series anymore. It's run by the ABA, but I had a, I had a pretty good run in there. I actually, I actually got an angler of the year in that series one year and oh, cool. with really nothing to show for it at the end of the day. <laughs> but, yeah. That's what's so frustrating. I remember the first year, oh, the only year I really tried to make a go at it. And I had to finish in the top 10 points to what, what, whatever the ABA's national thing is, the forest race, whatever cup that you follow. And then you go down to the regional and then everyone's jackpotting the damn tournament. And that really, I don't know, that put a bad taste in my mouth for some of these regional things when like you have yeah. to fish all of your events and then we go down to Kerr and then I go through and I look through and it's like, wow, look, look at all these guys that, 
paid their entry fee for the other tournaments and blanked or didn't show up. And then they, cause they knew they could get on to Kerr in October. And I know like BFLs do that now too. And it's just such a weird money grab to say like, just don't, you know, give us your money. Don't have to fish them just so you can cherry pick tournaments. Cause that, that doesn't really show off anyone's skill set, which I thought is the point of this stuff. Yeah. It's funny. I was talking to a, a good buddy about that and the, the BFL regionals and it's like, they go way down the list to try to fill up the you know number of boats and there's there's guys that are good fishermen that don't mm-hmm. fish all the events and get in you know and it's sort of like you know how's that fair you know i mean i get it you've got you've got co-anglers and if you have more co-anglers and boaters and you know they're trying to fill those seats you know and now that the bfl regionals are a pay to enter thing there's definitely more of a money grab you know yeah, it's just, I don't know. I don't, I don't like it because, again, with, with the sport trying to be saying that we're actually a sport, take us seriously. But then, by the way, you can buy your way into the regionals. I mean, what other freaking sports? Like, yeah, we're going to buy our way into the playoffs. Like, that's it's just bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's always been that way. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a far cry from what, you know, the, the old uh, Ray Scott Bassmaster, <laughs> you know, tournaments are, but – you know, I just, I, like I've told another one of my buddies who's a guide, I'm like, you just got to be better than the other guys, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, take that, take the, take, do the best with the opportunities you're given. But most of these tournaments, when I say I fish 30 tournaments a year, a lot of times, you know, I'm just using those tournaments to practice for other events, you know, Ooh, keep, really? yourself, keep your skills sharp, you know, because eventually what I kind of feel like is you kind of, you know, if you win an event, you kind of build up to that point. You find enough on the Potomac, you find enough at Anna or, or where bugs or whatever to do well, you know, in one of them. And you just got to make the most of your opportunities. Can you fish to like, I like how you said that, like use some tournaments to practice for others. I mean, what is the best balance of time versus just going out non-tournament to figure things out, but also learn new techniques versus trying to fish tournaments all the time? Because I got friends that every weekend they have available, they're fishing a tournament versus just going out, screwing around. I haven't learned a swim jig. I'm just going to go throw a swim jig. Like, is there a secret sauce to the balance in that situation? I don't know about if there's any secrets to it, but you know, I know that you know I'm, I'm 45 years old now. I've been doing this for 25 years practice for me at this point at most of these lakes we go to the same lakes the same time of year every year yeah you know you, you don't want to totally get caught up in history you know but at the same token you have a pretty good idea of what you're going to do so i go out you know a day or two before the tournament any fish i catch isn't it's one i'm not going to catch in the tournament you know so i try to either kind of practice around where i'm going to fish or you know, maybe look for something a little bit different that, you know, I can, I can exploit on my way traveling to and from spots, something like that. Um, I think it's probably the best explanation I can give you. So if you wanted to learn, I mean, it's a hot technique arc now, the Domeki rig, um, then you just practice that in the tournament. Or if you wanted to bring a new technique into your rotation, how would you do that? Would you just um, well, I mean, I, I'm kind of lucky. My, my, my family has a house at Smith mountain Lake and I spend a lot That's of time nice. there in, in the summer. And, uh, I've, I've, you know, whether it's Memorial day weekend or the 4th of July or whatever, I'll get up early, go out for three or four hours and come pick up the family. And I'll, you know, wife can sunbathe in the back of the boat and kids can, I can drag them in the tube and I can fish, you know, around and kind of learn stuff that way. That's mm. sort of what I do anyway but you know i try to do it in a way that i'm including my family on what i'm doing but at the same token i'm not just out on the bass boat hardcore concentrating on whatever it is you know learning how to throw a drop shot or something but that's you know that's one of the ways i got better with the drop shot was you go to smith mountain lake in the middle of the summer you're not exactly going to be able to go around and flip a sweet beaver on a dock and catch them it doesn't work that way (laughs) Yeah, because I that, that's the one fascinating thing I think is about how you balance your time when you're not getting paid to do this and you can be on the water, camp out at a lake for like three weeks straight. And like, yeah, that's almost it's easy at that point to learn something new. It's different when it's like I got 10 weekends a year. Do I fish tournaments or do I go out and kind of like learn something new? Um, I yeah. think a lot of people kind of struggle with that balance because I don't want to yeah. just donate my money when oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, I, I probably mean, should learn something. I mean, most of these events like 
at least in my opinion, with the BFL. Okay. You're, you got to make lemonade. Okay. You're not going to get the spot you want. You're not going to be able to do exactly what you want because someone's going to be there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you want a brush pile that's off of a point. I can promise you someone else knows about it, you know, so you can try to boat race, but at the most, most of these events, it's about, okay, I'm going to have to scratch around and get five fish, you know, and do the best I can with that and just sort of, you know, wait for your opportunities, you know, for things to go well for you to, you know, get a little bit back. You know, I, I tell every, all the younger guys that, you know, you got to make lemonade, you know, just, just know that that bank that you want, you're not going to get, you know, and you're not going to get it first. That doesn't mean you're not going to get it second. And you need to also understand that you're going to be fishing behind people and you yep. can't let that intimidate you. Do you, how do you practice compared to a multi-day versus a single day event? Cause I've always thought it's interesting. I've had guys on there like, listen, I will not fish BFLs. I only want to fish like the Toyota series or something like that. Uh, part of it is for payback, you know, your, your pay, but also it's like you can make those micro adjustments versus a one day is just all lottery. I, I don't know how I feel about that though. Like, what what are your thoughts on like how you approach a one day versus multi day when it comes to practice? Well, you got to fish fish that day, fish to win the day. You know the conditions are going to dictate what you can do. You know if it's blowing twenty five miles an hour, and all you practiced was offshore, you know if you're scoping or something, that's not going to play in the tournament. You know that's why I say practice is, you know, after at, at, at certain mm -hmm. point it's not helpful. Yeah. You know, I mean, we were just down at Smith Mountain Lake um, for the first BFL. It was in Piedmont. The Friday before the tournament, it was raining like cats and dogs and was 35 degrees outside. Yeah. Everyone in my house, and these are seasoned good fishermen, nobody went out. I mean, one guy did. And, you know, the next day I'm like, look, I know what I'm going to do. You know, what am I going to do? Go out there and get soaked? You know, so you got to remember you got to win that day you know, which five big fish, you know, not five for 12 pounds, you know, I mean, and I've, I've had that conversation with, with, you know, a couple guys that are on tour and I'm like, look, you, you, you know, you don't want to do what I'm going to do because it's not going to play for you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. No, you know? <laughs> that's the conversation. If you're going to tell kids going into this, like it is two different styles. It's like a guy that wants to swing for the fence. He's going to strike out a ton, but he's going to hit a couple of home runs. That's the one day guy. That's, that's the and one that's, tournament guy. That's how I've always looked at it. I might yeah. like, you know, the Chickahominy this past weekend, it was a region tournament. There's like 40 some boats in it. And we found a spot in a grass bed that, the day before that, you know, I've fished it before. We caught three nice fish out of it. And I left. That's the spot you go win the day, 20 pounds. We sat on it like all day, never had a bite in the tournament. And then at noon, we just went flipping and caught five for seven pounds. You know, I mean, that's the way that I think you got to do it, you know, and sometimes that means throwing a swim bait all day. You know, I mean, it's with mountain Lake. My, I got a good friend, uh, Boogie Atkins, who fishes BFL, has been doing it for years, has a ton of winnings. He just came in second in the cat. I mean, Boogie's a big swim bait guy. I mean, when he catches them, he's going to have 20 pounds, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why I say, you know, most tournaments is just for practice. You know, Boogie found some of those mm -hmm. fish. He had, he had two fish in the BFL for 13 pounds. <laughs> you know, wow. he went back last weekend and had 20 pounds, you know, so – it's uh, you kind of have to use your tournaments as practice. Yeah, that, that's what's it's so interesting when tying all this together, when, when Bass comes out and says like, well, we think it'll make a better angler if you fish all nine opens. And it's like, what will make a better angler is if you make a cheap tournament trail that's multi-day. Yeah. So people can practice multi-day events because the only ones out there is where you're paying five grand <laughs> to do multi-days and a multi-day tournament. And I learned this in college when we did our regionals and our nationals, it's a completely different animal. And unless you do it consistently, you don't get used to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the BFL, you got to make the second day, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've not made the cut many times, you know, and it hurts. I mean, I, there's been times when you're like, God, man, if I'd just made one little better decision, I know I'd have caught them the next mm -hmm. day. You know what I mean? 
I've, I've been kind of a proponent with BFL, not that they care what my opinion is, but I think they need to pay the top 50. Just give them your entry fee back, you know, mm. at some point, you know, if you want, you want to bring people in, you know, and it hurts not getting a check in those events. I mean, mm-hmm. shit, you get a place to stay and gas and, you know, all your lures and all that stuff. I mean, you got to win, you know, I mean that's, that's just all there is to it. I mean, second place in these events is, significantly less oh it's terrible it's terrible the payback is absolutely terrible and that's where one thing where it feels like okay maybe fishing a a toyota series would be better because at least if you finish in the top 20 percent you know you're going to substantially increase your profit margins hopefully or your break-even point than if you fish a bfl but then i've had guys come on that say like well i just fish the local bfl because like it is what it is you know it it doesn't matter to me but i'm not going to go fish the whole shenandoah series yeah and i mean you know what i I'm, I'm not getting any younger, you know, and I'm not going on tour anytime soon. And the tour for me and some of these guys that I fish with is just fishing BFLs. You know, I mean, it's, it's the working man's tour kind of, even though there's a lot of people that aren't doing a whole lot of work that are fishing. The BFL. But, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a thing. That's yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, if you're practicing for a all week for a BFL, I mean, you know, either, either you're, you know, really wasting all your vacation time, you know, or you're, uh, independently wealthy, you know, I mean, y- let's just say you have a, you know, a Phoenix or a Ranger or whatever you win 10 grand, your chances of winning that 10 grand are so slim. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you can have a great day and catch 20 pounds and be third, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I didn't even think of it that way. Like, so then did you ever in in your career think about making a a run at it? Yeah. And, you know, it it just didn't, you know, 2007, the economy really crashed and, you know, you have to make life decisions. You know, I'm lucky, you know, I've, I've, I've had a good job for a long time. I work in real estate development and, uh, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta kind of earn your stripes, you know, with that, which means you're going to be at your desk and you're going to be out in the field learning, you know, and that unfortunately, you know, cuts into your, uh, your screwing around fishing time. You know, there were some guys that we fished against that, you know, decided that they were just going to keep on fishing and I'm not going to mention any names, but things didn't really work out for them, you know, in the end. And, you know, again, nothing against them, but, you know, I had to make a decision, you know, guys like, uh, you know, Rob Greik is a good friend of mine, you know, Rob is probably the best tournament fisherman in Northern Virginia. And I don't, you probably, you probably don't even know who he is. And you know, that is Rob. why this channel exists because people yeah, need to know I mean, about him. Yeah. You know, he, he runs his own business. He does well, but the time that you need to go to wherever Okeechobee, mm-hmm. you know, to, to be successful, you just, you know, it's, it's a selfish endeavor. And I think more than ever, it's becoming more of a younger man's kind of game. Why? Well, I think, I think number one, you have a family, you know, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a selfish endeavor, you know, it really is. I mean, some of these guys, I mean, God, they're on the water all week long, you know, I mean, you're lonely, bored, you know, running up and down 95 or wherever they're going. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a male dominated sport. There's not a lot of, a lot of girls out there. that are going to put up with that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I went through a divorce. I'm sure fishing had something to do with it, you know, and uh, you know, it's like I said, it's a, it's a very selfish endeavor, <laughs> but I, I, uh, we, you got to do your best. So. Yeah, you're right. I mean, is this a region example is like Texas, Florida, there are places where you can just be a regional stick, never go pro oh. and do okay. Is this area set up for that? Or are we just kind of that weird, like limbo where if we're a little further North, you may be, or a little further South. I, I don't think it's quite to what goes on in Florida and Texas. I mean, that Texas mm-hmm. tournament trail and like the big, those big team events down in Florida. I mean, those are $10,000 minimum you know, there's been a few trails around here that have tried to emulate that. Like the, like I fished the elite 70, elite 70. Yeah. you know, but even then I think first place in the elite 70 is like six grand, you know? And I mean, you can't live off that, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, God shit, I've come in second two years in a row in the two day in the BFL on the river. And I mean, you you want to talk about, you know, 
of a Phoenix boat. You know, I mean, I've been inches away from a huge payday. It just didn't, you know, for one reason or another, it just didn't happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, look, if you if you won the Toyota on the river this September, sure, there's one guy that's going to win that event. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I can I can sit here and name a million region sticks that are regional sticks that are great. Bobby Fincham, Doug Grubbs. I mean, those guys win a lot. You know, and I mean, I can tell you right now, nobody's retiring on those win- on those winnings. Those guys work full time. You know, that's what's mo- most impressive thing in the world to me. You know, down at Smith Mountain Lake, I think, you know, Chad Green and Johnny Martin, I don't really know those guys that well, just friends of friends. They win a lot of money, you know, and they don't really fish BFLs. I mean, they just fish big team events. They get that, they win that Skeeter money, you know, so there might be a few guys that can, but for the most part, I would say no. Yeah. It's it's very interesting when you think of it that way. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, just I, sort of my opinion. I mean, everybody's no, got an opinion. <laughs> no, no, because like it, it's founded because it's so weird. When I talk to high school kids a lot, and now that I have this this platform and stuff, and Jake Spate and Tackle, you know, they run a youth a youth group and stuff, and and they ask like, well, "What do you got to do?" And it's like, guys, get <laughs> learn a trade, uh, go to school. Yeah, like don't. This is not like baseball, and even if it was like a professional sport like that, it's still only the one percenters. And a little luck that allows you to do this. I and mean, we were talking before we started here about like the amount of debt you have to go into is is stupid. Yeah, I've I've been lucky, man. Like I, I've only you know I, this is the first new boat that I have ever had. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, God, I've blown up a couple of motors, and it's been painful. You know, I mean, if if the the high school kids are looking for advice. You know, I don't think looking at Jacob Wheeler and, you know, the, the Icon $160,000 bass boat. is. Oh, my God. That go. thing is insane. Holy I actually shit. listened to his podcast the other day in regards to sort of the, the uh, it was just really about live scope and active target. And it, he made a really good point. It's sort of like at the grassroots level, it. I don't know that it should be part of it because you need to learn how to fish first, okay? Mm-hmm. Which means you got to learn how to pattern fish, you know? And then, you know, as you advance, you know, those expensive pieces of equipment can become kind of a standard on your boat. You know, it's just sort of like, we don't drive around in F1 formula race cars, you know, we, it's not necessary. Yeah. You know, so I think it's, I think it's super important that, the kids that really want to pursue this. And I mean, you know, I don't, I don't deter anyone from doing it. You know, if that's what they want to do, then, you know, have at it, but understand that there's a massive financial commitment that goes along with this. No one's going to give you a boat. No one's going to give you a truck. No one's going to give you a place to live. (laughs) So, you know, you you really got to think about those things. And I would think that having some grassroots ability like I say, to make lemonade is a, is a, would be a valuable asset on tour. No, that, that, that is interesting what Jacob Wheeler said about live scope and, and grassroots. Cause I do think that that's the biggest issue with it. I mean, I mean <laughs> are you, for, did you see that? I'm just curious if you No, no, yeah, I, I, mean, I was just, I, I skimmed through the bass, uh, Jay Kumar's thing just to try to get notes and stuff. I, in the week. I didn't listen. I mean, I'm just telling you what I took from yeah. it was, you know, it's having a $12,000, active target on your boat is probably not necessary for <laughs> guys fishing region tournaments. Well, you know, and young and guys, th- especially cause it's the barrier to entry, you know? Yeah. But the th- so in youth sports, I know in, in my old life, that was something that you'd see when, when Easton came out with the first double wall, uh, car- yeah. uh, carbon baseball bat. And it was about 300, 400 bucks. And that thing was hot as shit. And yep. you could give that to a scrawny little kid, 10 year old, and he's already setting, he's hitting warning track shots. Yeah. And you literally did have an advantage. If you had that, you had an distinct advantage. It was there, it was available to you. And it did make you a little bit better. How much better? I don't, I can't quantify it, but you did have an advantage. Oh, well that's, you know, if yeah, you put, li- I, if, I agree. You know, if you put live scope on your boat and you're one of the first, those couple years ago, you had a hell of an advantage when Hummingbird and Lawrence absolutely. didn't have it. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Like, like, so, and I agree though, like what should have happened is people told the BFLs and these other things like, Hey, listen, 
you're not allowed to have it. Crappie tournaments do that right now. You can have your live scope version and your non. That's yeah. the template you should follow in these local derbies, my opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, you know, I don't think there's ever been anything that's impacted fishing the way that the active target has impacted it, you know, and, you know, it's not guaranteed. There are guys who are very good at it, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, Lord only knows I've gotten my ass kicked by those guys a million times, but there's also times when that doesn't play, you know, and like I said, you know, getting a five fish limit and making lemonade, take advantage of the opportunities that you have, you know, you'd be surprised at the end of the year where you end up, you know, I mean, the angler of the year in the Shenandoah or Piedmont division is a, hell of an accomplishment um chris brummett you know he's a good friend of mine you know uh from down the swift mountain lake area i mean what he's done is impressive he's won two angler of the years out of the last three i think i mean that's and he's not just relying on live scope i can promise you he's a good fisherman you know and you know you you just gotta you know you, you got you gotta weigh in five fish every event 10 pounds on bugs in the middle of May, when maybe you do get your ass kicked that day is going to be worth its weight in gold in September, you know? Shenandoah division has got to be, and I remember this my first year of the college thing, and we got to go down to the national championship and you meet with like all these other people because they have this big meet and greet and they ask you like how far you travel and living near DC, I would tell them, it's like, oh crap, that's crazy. You know, the Alabama is like, we just five minutes for every tournament. Is the Shenandoah division one of the divisions that you do have to put some miles on your car? It has to be one of the top. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky because I'm from Smith Mountain Lake, so my, my family's down there, so I got a place to stay for free, you know. Um, but going to Bugs, you know, I mean, I'm, again, lucky through 25 years of relationships. I've got some friends that live down there, and I mean, even then, though, you don't want it. My brother, my brother mm -hmm. lives in Richmond, right? like 30 minutes from Osborne. But the problem is, and he's got a house with plenty of room. It's just, you don't want to go annoy the shit out of people, you know, yeah. staying at their houses, getting up at 3 a.m. Nobody kind of understands what you're doing. It, you know, you're definitely going to do some driving, you know, and like I've got 200,000 miles on my, my Tundra out there and I have a brand new Tahoe that I share with my wife. And the only reason I got that was because I really don't want to make those long toes with that Tundra at this point. Because yeah. I'm just begging for something <laughs> to happen, you know? Yeah. It, it creates an interesting angler when you come from this area, especially Northern Virginia, because the amount of commuting you have to do to, to, to hit everything, especially you know, down South. Um, I don't know why they do it that way, but I don't know it smarter powers than me. Yeah. You would, I think, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the deal is, why we don't go a little bit further north. You know, some of the guys from this area have been fishing the, the whatever, the, the northeast division. Yeah. They go to the upper bay and, you know, they go, how they go to like Oneida and places like that. I, I've considered doing that just because the fishing is just better you know, at those places, you know, they it's just not more a, fun. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, but they're, they're even longer hauls. Oh yeah. Know? And I mean, by the time you, I, I give my wife a schedule of what I'm doing <laughs> and it's like, okay, this weekend, you know, is our anniversary. We're going to go to ocean city for the weekend. You know, I fish while I'm up there, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I can't, you know, but we go to the beach, you know, and then, you know, after the end of October, I can promise you the bass boats getting put away and does not get played with until, you know, <laughs> I, until March, you know, that's just oh the way gosh. it works. But these are all the realities that I think that the, the high school and college fishermen don't really understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You have, you have a wife and kids. She's not going to just put up with you, you know, one, unless you're just wealthy, not making any money Two being out in the water 24 seven. I mean, it's just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You know? And I like what you said earlier about there's no point in practicing seven days before the event. And it really does become about time on the water an accumulation over time. So if you live at Smith example, I guess would be, why would you be out there seven days in a row before an event? You should have a cumulative understanding of the lake and you just go out there and fish it. And that's, I think really, I think you're right. That's how you should approach these one day events. 
because over time you're going to know the Potomac, you're going to know Kerr, you're going to know these places and, and, and trying to just kind of like fast track that or cram before the exam. That's not going to really do you much good. Yeah. I mean, like I said, there, there are some guys that are probably better at practicing than me. You know, there's, you know, I just mentioning that the guys from Smith mountain Lake, you know, those guys have spent an incomprehensible amount of time to find the fish that they've found and the techniques that they're using. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised that those guys haven't had more, more, uh, bent rod kind of problems, you know, that you, you deal with, you know, locally, but you know, you just, I just, I, for a guy like me fishing a BFL, me going down and fishing half the lake, well, what's, what's that going to do for me? Mm-hmm. You have eight hours, you know, and I, you know, you need to make the best of what you find. And sometimes you do have to just say, F it. And I got to go to the other end of the lake. Cause this ain't happening. It's mm-hmm. happened plenty of times, you know, but you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough that, you know, you know, you, you gotta, you catch one or two fish, you know, again, make lemonade, you know, and then take advantage of your opportunities. I keep, I keep saying that because that's just the way I, the way I see it, you know? What do you think it's like though, fishing in the echo chamber of locally? Like I've always found that fascinating versus trying to fish more regional stuff. So, well, one of the problems you deal with, and you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Drama. You, <laughs> you, you, okay. You have buddies, buddies get on a school of fish mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, I can't go down there and jump on top of them. You know I mean? And that's a problem. That's a big problem with the Potomac. These damn fish sit in some place all year. Yeah. It's un- incomprehensible, you know? And, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of self-control, you know, to, to kind of, you know, not, not every tournament's going to get one off the same spot, but there've been two spots in the Potomac river over the last probably five years that I would say 90% of the tournaments have been won. And I know where they are and I have to use my self-control to not go there, you know? And at the same token, when you earn that kind of respect from other fishermen, when you are in an event that isn't involving them, you can go fish that stuff, you know? So it's sort of a give and take and there's, there is a lot of drama, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to sit back and say, Oh, well, everything's been found. Uh, mm, no, not really. <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't really work that way. But expand on that. What do you mean by everything has been found in the sense of like, you still think like, I think you can have sneaky holes on a one day local Absolutely. event. I don't yeah. think, how do you have a one? You can't have sneaky holes though. If you're in the bass opens, the Toyota, the bass masters, yeah. because of the boat field and the multi days. Like I, I just don't see how that translates or, or people think it translates. If that makes sense. When you're talking about, you know, 200 boat event on a, a big body of water, there's going to be people that figure out a pattern. Okay. Yeah. And they can run that pattern from all over the lake, you know, usually patterns, at least in my opinion, are sort of depending on what area of the lake you're in, it can affect what fish are doing, you know, but if you, you know, going to, going out on the Potomac and seeing 30 boats in a grass bed, you know, there's a pretty good chance there's, there's some fish there, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, that's just sort of a weird thing about the Potomac. Florida's like that too. You know, the fish are all in the monkey box and that's where everybody's going to be, you know, but at the same token, when your buddies win, let's just say in a quiet Creek, you shouldn't just go fish 20 yards away from them in the next event because you're not okay, helping yeah, I see anybody. What you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You know, that's, and that's just sort of my opinion on it, you know, and, you know, my, my buddy Tommy Harden is a, is a guide on the river. And I mean, he, he follows the fish around all the time. You know, Tommy does well guiding, you know, out there. It's funny. He, he does a lot of snakehead trips, interestingly enough. I mean, people are into that sort of the non endemic people are into that, you know, mm-hmm. But, you know, at the same token, you know, I think Tommy's paranoid that people are watching him. They know he's guiding. He's posting stuff on social media. You know, I've told him a million times, you know, listen, man, you got to you got to kind of rise above it. You know, people are going to bent ride you. It's just what's going to happen. You know, they know who you are. 
you know, but at the same token, you got to be better than them on Saturday. If you're in a tournament, you got to be better. Jacob you know, Wheeler talked about that too. It was whenever he wanted Chickamauga and it was, yeah, it was that, it was that Toyota invitation to tackle warehouse invitational series, whatever the hell it was called back then. But he said like, this was my home. Like he had to w- have a camouflage bent in practice. And the way he was talking was absolutely insane about like, so if I go to this spot day one, that'll be burnt because people will see me. So then this is where I have to go the next day. And just like how he understood how to deal with social media and boat pressures and people. That was so fascinating just to listen to him walk through this in his head. And I feel like the problem with a lot of local anglers is they think like, well, this is the secret spot. And if somebody finds out about this, like I'm completely screwed. And they they don't, I think, have a mastery of the lake to know like, okay, well, if they're here, this is going to move the fish here. And then this is my next, you know, chessboard move. And I feel like that holds a lot of anglers back. Oh, yeah. Well, the Potomac is a spot fishery. Oh, yeah. Pot- yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not. It's not Gunnersville where you have offshore, you have grass mats, you have, you can fish docks or wood. I mean, the Potomac, the fish, and one of the, if you talk to any sort of the old heads around here, one of the problems with the Potomac is there's, there's expanses of the Potomac where there's just no fish. Mm-hmm. It didn't used to be like that. So something's still kind of weird, you know, out there, you know, and I mean, you look at the results from Potomac teams last weekend and the river seems to be doing really well. But I can promise you those fish are coming from specific areas. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, Mattawoman, Belmont, you know, quiet. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's no spoilers of the, the big areas that, yeah. that, that I mean, do it's well. Like, you know, Dogue Creek. Dogue Creek was full of grass. With brother, you know, there was a big weekend series tournament years ago. I caught 20 pounds the first day in there. They're in a blade of grass in there mm-hmm. now. You know, what happened? You know, there's no reason to go in that creek. You know, so you can cross that one off the list. You're not going to, you won't be competitive if you go in there, you know? I, I mean, would you, because I've said this in the past, like title is the hardest place to win on, but probably the easiest place to like cash a check because you, you can have a consistent finish if you're willing to just suck it up and then, you know, fish the areas. But it's hard as hell to be able to find fish to, to last a multi-day event that is not going to get the snot pounded out of it. A single day, uh, I guess, is a little different, but I was thinking more of a multi-day. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, Brian Schmidt's record on the Potomac is unprecedented. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he, he won, I think he's got the record Toyota wins out there. And Brian has definitely fished his way into the national scene. And I, I respect him for that. You know, Brian didn't come from, you know, a, you know, we always joke, we, he doesn't have Scrooge McDuck's, you know, a uh, money pit. You know, and and he fished his way in. I mean, what he was able to find was and and do was incredible. You know, I mean, everybody has help along the way. You know, you get a, a tip here and there. You know, but you know, I think that, like I said, you just got to be better. You know, than other people. I mean, you have to have help. I mean, and, and then yeah. then you have to define what's acceptable amount. But there's no way if you have if you get dumped at it, like you get dumped at the Potomac. And it's your first time there all year. If you're on a big circuit, you're going to need a group of guys to help you break down that place just to get in the ballpark. Um, I had Harry on who, uh, who lives in Florida. And he said like, yeah, if you're fishing the Harris chain and you have all those lakes, you have got to have a, a group to say like these lakes, they're not playing right now just to narrow yeah. down the place. Yep. There's no way you could go through all that water by yourself. I mean, a couple of years ago when the regional, the BFL regional was on the Potomac, it was, it was amazing and funny to me at the same, I had, I fished with COVID for two days and that event about ready to die. So I'll make a little <laughs> bit of an excuse for myself. Everybody, I was telling everybody, I'm like, man, stay away from me. You know, I mean, I was really pretty sick and, but the funny thing to me was all like most of the locals, we didn't do anything. We were horrible. The guys from Ohio came here. They went into, it was Pohick at the time, yeah. and they just looked at the place with a totally different set of eyes. That's fascinating to me when that happens. Yeah. And they had caught, they killed them. And I mm-hmm. was like, God, how are we so stupid? You know, and it's like, you know, especially grass fish, they move around. You know, those guys came here with a fresh set of eyes and went, wow, look at this creek. We're, we're all fighting over a quiet catching shit. You know, and they all have 20 pounds. I was like, wow, that's it. That's why I say if you want to win a regional, I don't think you can do it legitimately on your home waters. You you really need to get away and put fresh eyes on something. How, you know? 
how hard is that? Because I look at like you, um, the, the individuals you're talking about at Smith, uh, um, Matt McCluskey on yep. Mountainhead, all these people, and you could throw a couple more. How do you consistently win on your home place, and then you get the big events, and you don't play head games with yourself and fish past history? Like that, I don't know that you, I don't know that you can, yeah. especially if you're from that place. You know, I mean, it's. Do you fight that urge a lot? Let's say if you had a, a, a big tournament tomorrow on Smith, like, is that really hard for you mentally? Be like, ah, I got to live in the present and not just think the past. I got, I got a fishers of men coming up down there in a couple of weeks. And I can promise you, I'm going to swing for the fence and <laughs> because what I do will not play in a, in a, in a, mm. in a, in a team event down there. I could go, I could go where I like to fish at Smith mountain Lake and catch 15 pounds in a BFL and do great. Okay. I could be in the top 10, 12, 15 with that, get a nice little check. And one of the, th the reasons that you go fish a team event where you got two guys fishing for the same amount, that 15 pounds does you nothing. There's no point in even showing up, you know, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm going to go where the eight pounders live. You got to catch one, you know, and what's the difference? You know, let's just say you struggle and have three fish. Oh, well. What's the difference in having 15 pounds in that event? Nothing, you know, That's true. who cares? You know, you gotta, you, you gotta kind of take pride out of it a little bit, you know? Um, I, th I think, you know, I fish very differently than, you know, a, a lot of the, the younger guys do, you know, I don't, I mean, I have live scope. I don't really use it that much. I probably should, but you know, if, if you're a shallow water guy like me, you know, I, I think that it is really hard, you know, to not fish history. You got to really try, you know, when like, it's like I, we were talking about high rock. I'd never had been to high rock before in my life. I went down there and I wasn't there for five minutes practicing and caught a five pounder. And I was like, what the hell, you know, and kind of just took that one piece of information and caught a couple more fish. And I was like, okay, I don't need to practice anymore. This is what I'm going to do. You know, that, that next, the tournament, which was two days later, I caught, I think I had three fish really quick and the high rocks got big fish in it. They were all like four pounders, you wow. know, somehow I caught a fourth fish. And at that point I, I actually drew a guy who I used to fish against at Fountainhead as my co-angler hell of a nice guy. Your, your draw is very important in these events, even as a boater. That is you interesting. You a co-angler who's cool, who's going to go with the flow and not be questioning you or saying, hey, we need to go do this or, you know, go do that. And Hey, there's sometimes when you do need help and you're like, hey, man, you know, if you got something by all means, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, but, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Slauson, who I, saw, I always joke with him, I said, I think you saw the pinnacle of my fishing career we we were out in the main lake we had about 30 minutes to go we hadn't had a bite in hours and it was so funny because he caught a four pounder behind me in the morning good for him i mean he didn't do anything to affect me and i told him i said man billy i said you don't know how lucky you are this place isn't that good <laughs> and uh you know we went out on the main lake and i was like how can no one ever catch him out here on this main lake wood. I don't know. We were, I had turned the radio on the boat. We were listening to, I don't know. We were listening to some crazy song. That's awesome. Here comes a boat from down there with all these uh, Hooters girls. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and we're in there waving to <laughs> us, you know, and I'm just sitting there kind of, this is a true story. And I'm just sitting there laughing. And I literally had flipped my jig into this, tree just giant lay down if you've ever been to high rock before there's just trees out in the middle of the lake okay and i flipped it over there and i just was like why am i st i'm like stuck and i went oh my god i'm not stuck and i i set the hook right and the music's blaring and billy's sort of you know, like, you know, like looking around you know and, <laughs> and i'm like i first thing i was like, there's a lot of catfish in that lake and i was like oh, fucking catfish i know it and I sit there and this six pounder just jumps out of the water right next to the boat. And I went, Jeez. holy shit, get the net, get the net. And I, he netted him. And I literally was like, what a friggin' miracle. Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, I pretty much quit fishing. I was like, dude, 
I don't know what to tell you. I'm out of, I'm out of ideas, you know, and they're not biting. So, you know, I had just enough, you know, to catch a few fish in the tournament and got very lucky and caught a six pounder right at the end of the day. That's, That's awesome. how you win. <laughs> I mean, when it's your time, it's your time too. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm blessed to have a little bit of skill and I uh, got really lucky with that one. How important is your draw in a one day event to be able to have success? Super important. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it goes both ways, you know, as a co-angler, you, you need a boater that, you know, is, you know, around some fish, you know, it's up to you to catch them. You know, my co-anglers do well. My last two co-anglers have won the two day on the Potomac. Wow. Um, you know, I've had plenty of big checks taken out of the back of my boat, you know, and I, I, I you know, as long as you're not casting on top of me, you know, or doing something to drive me crazy. I'm, I'm all for it, man. I'm happy for you. You know, um, what West Daisy, uh, the guy that, uh, won with me last year on the Potomac, he, he had a magic Rico. That's all I can say. <laughs> they thought Rico. mine was horrible <laughs> and he caught, he had like 15 pounds and I think I had a limit for like seven pounds or something. Oh my gosh. And, uh, but you know, it's the same thing. You know, I, uh, once he had, the, I said, dude, I mean, he knew he'd won and I'm like, look, man, I got to change it up here a little bit. And with about an hour to go, I mean, he really laid off. I mean, and he caught all this fish on the Rico. It was, it was quite amazing. I mean, I was like, dude, what, what the, you know? And, uh, I picked up a spinner bait and I ran over to another spot and, and caught two, four pounders with minutes to go. Mm. and you know i had like 13 pounds i i was i thought i'd won and unfortunately the the guy who was in like fifth caught like 17 pounds so he edged me out <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is very important and i i start my conversation with my co-angler in every event you know hey man we're gonna have a good time all i ask is please don't cast on top of me that's all i ask mm -hmm. you know i don't care if you smoke cigarettes or drink a 12 pack, you know, but you know, let's, you know, just don't cast on top of me. It doesn't do either one of us any good. It's interesting. Cause I think, is it the BFLs are thinking about getting a rid or you can pay extra. So you don't actually have to have a co-angler. That's interesting. Like yeah. how well that'll take off. Um, well, I, I think know. with, I think with live scope, you know, if you're a co-angler and you draw a guy that's staring oh, at that, that screen suck. all day long, I mean, <laughs> what the f is that? You know, I mean, I would be, I'd be like, why are we doing this? You know, that's, that's a real thing. And of course, you know, they want to deny that that's not a problem. I think you're already seeing it. You know, the two BFLs that I've fished this year, they're like, Hey, we need four co-anglers. Well, yeah, I bet you do because nobody wants to sit behind a few guys and stare at, while they stare at a screen and have no chance of catching a fish all day long. You know, I also, I, mean, I also, if the rising kayaking has also heard it some too. Yeah. I mean, you know, I go to Florida every year for, for two weeks and uh, I, I fish out of the kayak when I'm down there a lot and uh, I actually enjoy it. You know, it's good exercise, you know, but uh, it's definitely made some things more accessible. All I'll ask all the kayak guys out there is don't schedule a kayak tournament when you know there's a BFL at Smith Mountain Lake. Thank you. It's yeah, obnoxious. Just common sense common sense there when you're out on the water um but i don't know like that that whole thing is fascinating to me because again they're getting so like this past weekend we had a big kayak show and it was just more of like bring your pimped out kayaks just to show <laughs> them off for this yeah, club I, and it was in like this one guy's kayak was like 12 grand it was like holy crap but he's like i live in ashburn um i, I can't where am i gonna put a skeeter you know, and so like, all right, fair enough, but good yeah. God, that's insane. That's, that's, you're, you're taking it, you know, if you've ever seen the movie, this is Spinal Tap, you're taking it to 11 with the, <laughs> yeah. with the, with the $12,000 kayak. But. But, but, but then again, it's like, okay, if you can scratch that itch though, and that's where I'm, I'm wondering yeah. like how much, how much the boating world is going to be hurt by this. And I think what will happen is like, you're just going to have big, big boat manufacturers. They're just going to buy out the kayaks and they're just going to own them. Like, Ooh, why wouldn't it, you? Yeah. It's, it's definitely, you know, what do you want to get out of it kind of a thing? You know, I, I love catching fish. I mean, one of my favorite things in the world to do is I fish for uh, sheep's head and uh, tautogs up at uh, oh, cool. uh, Ocean City. Really? And uh, we, I do that a lot in, uh, in Florida, too. It's, uh, 
I love it, man. You get a bite on every cast, you know? And I mean, it's like, a, it's a nice little break from, you know, let's be honest, these public bodies of water. I mean, <laughs> Mm -hmm. You catch 10 fish, you've had a great day, you know, I mean, that, and that could be a two pounder to a five pounder, but, you know, going and catching 40 or 50 fish, that's a lot of fun. If you ask me, are you, are you going out in a kayak boat or from shore? Uh, from shore usually. And then it's in the kayak. Some. That is something I want to, once I get, um, once I save up and I actually get a torpedo or something, I want to actually go out and do some more salt water stuff from a, from a kayak. Cause that just looks like so much freaking fun to get out there and do that. Oh my God, man. The, the sheep's head fishing. I try, I've tried to get some of my bass buddies into it. You don't understand how awesome it is. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you, you literally get a bite on every cast wow. and being a bass fisherman will make you a better sheep's head fisherman. There is a hmm. technique and a skill to it that a lot of people don't have. And man, I tell you what, like up, we go to the Indian river inlet and man, I just hammer those fish and those guys that, you know, you've got some guys with some very expensive equipment, you know, trying to catch them and they can't. And I'm just, hmm. it's, it's a technique you, you learn from bass fishing. You, you don't just set the hook as soon as you feel the bite. You got to feel that little pull. How, how big do sheephead get? I think they get giant, like 10, 12 pounds. Oh, you know, damn. The biggest one I've ever caught is an eight pounder, but a five pounder, I can promise you. It's like catching a five pound bluegill. Holy crap. Yeah. That would, I mean, that would be a fight. I catch them. I use a flipping stick and a uh, tungsten weight <laughs> to catch them. It's pretty funny. I, my, my technique is definitely not what most of those guys are doing. Have you caught any like uh, the speckled trout and the redfish that are starting to come up this way? I keep hearing that there's more redfish in the bay now than ever before. That's what I've heard. I, I know guys who have caught a, when the salt really comes up the Potomac. I know a guy who's caught multiple redfish on the on the Potomac. I mean, I know guys who have caught flounder. Uh, there was a pro mm -hmm. a few years ago who had a video of a shark down at the beach down in Aquia. Um, so they definitely, you know, get in. You know, I, I you know, me and Rob were in D.C. This was probably 10 years ago. It was a massive drought. And uh, it was the one of the years that the reservoir fountainhead was, I mean, there was no water in the reservoir. It was unbelievable. And we had a Potomac teams tournament right after we got a big rain. You should have seen all the dead bluefish up in DC. It was unreal. Really? Yeah. They, well, they just went up there, you know, the <laughs> salinity just, you know, like I, I caught a, uh, I caught a puppy drum in a, in a BFL um, down in the James a few years ago. I trust me, you set the hook on that and you're like, Oh yes. And then you're like, Oh, get out of here. <laughs> you know, there's not helpful. <laughs> there's a huge saltwater scene here that we don't, I had last year, I had one of the contestants. Uh, there's a big ocean city kayak event. I think it's like a $10,000 grand prize. Wow. And I had him on last year and he talked about like, yeah, it's massive. Especially when you get out there in a kayak and you hook a bull drum or a cobia, he said it is, it, it'll make you quit bass fishing. It's so addicting to get oh, yeah. turned around I, by those things. I, I, I tell everybody, my, my old uh, high school football coach who, uh, he moved to Southwest Florida. I get down there and fish with them, you know, once or twice a year. And, uh, he's like, God, I'll never fish a bass tournament ever again. <laughs> oh, if you live in Florida. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, he's like, look, dude, is you want to catch a bass? He's like, just go right there, you know, but he, he's just big into the, uh, you know, the, the, the trout and redfish and snook scene. And they're just a lot more agreeable fish. And as many people as f that fish down there, most of those people don't really have sort of the, the bass fishing skills that we've developed. So mm -hmm. they don't really know how to flip a lure under a dock or, you know, work a zero spook or, you know, stuff like that. They really just don't have that. And they're all sort of bait fishermen, it, you know, and the interesting thing down there too, is that there's a lot of trophy real estate and trophy boats that look like great fishing boats. And they either sit at the dock 99% of the time, or they take it out to the sandbar and whip out the cooler, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not, it's uh for a scene that's got that much money and boats and stuff. It's really, I think the pressure is minimal. You know, would you live in Florida if you, if you had your way? Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely. Southwest Florida all the way. That's same thing here. Cause I, I think if I lived down there, I would never bass fish. There's just so many other things to do. Like I say, I go down there for two weeks every year we go to Marco and I, I, I had a friend from high school that's from there and been going there for years 
if you saw the amount of fish that I catch just out of the kayak and off the beach in the jetties, bass fishing, you'd be like, man, this is, <laughs> this is boring. You never catch anything, you know? What's the biggest thing you've caught from a kayak? Oh my God. I hooked the, I wouldn't even catch it, but I, I hooked a tarpon that was as big as the kayak. Holy shit. And <laughs> I, I mean, it, it was, it was funny because, you know, being a bass fisherman, I'm out there. I was, I usually, my wife usually comes with me. I always say she's my trolling motor, <laughs> but we were, we were catching like trout and ladyfish. It's this one point. I've never seen another boat on this point. It's a place called Roberts Bay. Every home on this bay is probably eight to $10 million. Okay. Every boat at the dock has six giant outboards and is probably a million dollars for these boats. I've never seen anyone out there fishing in all the years I've been going down there. So I, I go out on this point and like, you can catch these lady fish and trout that are like, you know, three, four pounders, you know? So I kept seeing giant, there's sharks and stuff, you know, you gotta remember that, you know, mm. when you're down there. So I was getting kind of nervous because it's getting kind of late. You know, I kept seeing some big fish roll and I'm like, God, that, I probably need to get out of here because you start catching a bunch of fish. The sharks will come in on you. And uh, I, I don't know if I was reeling in a lady fish or what. And all of a sudden, right by the boat, I mean, this fish, I mean, my rod, I can't even explain to you what it's, it bent all the guides on my rod, you know, to the left. And I, it jumped and I was like, oh my God. Yeah, I had like 30 pound braid. And I'm like, well, maybe. I can catch this fish, you know, <laughs> if, if I can just let him pull me around, it's a maybe. And he finally just straightened the hook, you know, it was on a little, little swim bait. Oh you my know. God. That's so much fun. But I, I mean, I can't tell you how many fish we catch. My wife just laughs at me. You know, I'm always <sighs> like, go over there, go over there, <laughs> you know? Oh my God. That sounds like so much fun to land something like that from a kayak. Yeah. But you know, that's just sort of my, my joy of fishing. And I, and I love bass fishing too. It's just, you know, we all have to work. We have real jobs. You know, it's a, it's a great distraction from the weekly grind of what you really have to do. You know? but, yeah. And that's why I've, I've kind of gotten like turned off from tournament <laughs> fishing in general and just doing other things. I'm trying to pick up fly fishing a little bit, trying to explore some new places. Cause it's just, I don't know. It's not yeah. there as much. And it's plus, it's just like, unless you want to like go at it hard. I, I don't know. There's just so many other things you can do in the fishing world that people really do. You get so tunnel vision oh. to bass and you oh, don't yeah. realize there's so much other stuff out there. Yeah. When I go to Swift mountain Lake in the summers, I, I striper fish a lot. Oh you know, really? That's, that's especially with the live scope. I mean, it's there. The stripers have no hope <laughs> when it comes to live scope. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're not bass are so temperamental, you know, I mean, I'm sure some of the great, you know, live scope guys will tell you otherwise, but, you know, the stripers, oh my God, you know, you drop a Demiki, well, Demiki rig is a famous, uh, mm -hmm. a new, a, the new word for fluke on a jig head. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, you know, you, <laughs> they don't always bite it, but in the summertime when their metabolisms are high, oh my God, you got to be careful too. Cause there's big ones and you, you catch them, you really can't release them. They'll die, you know? So we'll go out in the morning and catch a limit you know, which is two fish per person, you know, eat them for dinner. You know, we do that a lot, but you know, my, my experiences with the bass that time of year is like, you'll, you'll find a school, you can catch a couple and then you bust the school up and then, you know, they're kind of gone or you got to wait for them to regroup, you know, but God, my, that would be fun. But yeah, I mean, it was funny. My, my, I was trying to prove a point to my wife with a school of bass. We found, she was sunbathing, you know, and, I found a big school of fish on a point and I threw over there and I, I caught like six and then the whole school just disappears, you know? And I'm like, just wait, you know, we like an hour, we kind of go down the bank, come back like an hour later, there they are again. You know, I'm like, yeah, just throw your shaky head. I shouldn't really like to fish, but you know, she, <laughs> then it's fun. You know, they were like two, two mm -hmm. and a half pounders. They weren't big ones, but you know, there's some guys like, you know, I, I, that's my biggest thing is like when it comes to bass, like, like I know that, you know, McCluskey, you know, he, he can look at the thing and tell you, well, that's a five pounder. I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know I can't it is that. still impressive to me because it looks, you know? it looks like an LSD trip to me. And yeah, it's just I mean, like it's, the people that can, you know, being down on the chick last weekend and struggling, I went kind of out on the, the ledge and was like, man, there's a lot of fish out here. And they're, 
they'll come over and look at your jerk bait. You're kind of like, it could be a striper. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But the stripers move a little differently. At least what I've kind of learned, they're, they're faster and they look bigger. You know, the bass are a little bit more stationary, but that, yeah, it's still, it's still fun when you get into those though. Like, do, do you oh, yeah. think Smith mountain Lake is going to give up like a state record smallmouth or something like that? I mean, with the bluebacks in there, it could absolutely, you know, the bluebacks have completely changed all these places. It's, they, they really have, you know, a few years ago when we had the giant rain down there, um, I was down and, uh, the funny thing was the water was over the docks on the banks. I've never seen anything like that. So the people that were, that lived down there, they couldn't get out, couldn't get to their docks. But if you had a boat that you were launching, you could get in. And what was happening when I, one of the big guides down there, his wife's friends with my mom, he said, Hey man, you need to go down to the boom, go down to the dam, wait till like noon. You don't need to get up early. Just wait. You go down there and there were like four or five people tied up. And the current was incredible. I mean, it's, they're just pulling water, pulling water, pu pumping it into Leesville because the lake was five feet out of its banks. Never seen that. Wow. Well, what would happen was the schools of bluebacks, they'd be, be on the surface, would get pulled inside the boom up in front of where they, you know, let the water go. And the stripers would go absolutely ape for 20 minutes eating these things. If you threw an Alabama rig in there, you'd catch five. I mean, it was wow. unbelievable. And it would go on for like an hour. I would, I, you could caught one on a dollar bill. It didn't matter. I was, the kids are reeling them in. We That's were just awesome. throwing them back. You know, they're, they were all like five to eight pounders, but you're going to tell me there aren't, you know, 10 pound bass in there eating somewhere, you know, I mean, th th you know, it, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, why wouldn't they be there? You know? So, I mean, I, I'm sure of it. You know, there's giant fish in there. I, I reeled a swim bait in one time there and had a school of five pounders follow it. Never, I've never seen that anywhere. You know, there's 15 or 20 of them, you know? Yeah, I think it's between that. I think another place I'm going to explore this year is Lake Mumaw. I want to try to check that place out to see because like, I, I've heard rumors that there's some there's some good smallmouth in there that have not been tapped yet. Oh, yeah. It's, it's funny. The kid I drew... Uh, down at Bugs a couple of weeks ago was telling me about that. He said that Muma was really good. Well, and that's the thing. All you do is tournament fish. Like there's places like you just don't get to go and explore. And I miss kind of exploring because I, I know on the schedule, I'm going to Muma this year in Back Bay because I hear Back Bay is supposed yeah. to be fantastic for a frog. And they're like, okay, shoot, I could just throw a frog all day and no one's around. Like, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Why not do that? Well, the Chickahominy, if it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday and there's not 6,000 ski boats <sighs> running just, around and, and 18 yeah. tournaments going on, it's a very different fishery. Mm. You know, you can go down there and kill them. You know, like I'm serious. It's, there's a lot of fish down there and there are big ones. The problem is everybody starts running around, the fish clam up and they just don't bite. You know, one guy catches them, mm. you know, and it's uh, I think that's like that in all these places. And that's one of the things I think about the pro tour that, Wednesday, Thursday fishing is a lot different than Saturday, Sunday fishing. Oh, a hundred percent. Like, and I think that's like, again, what gives guys that are already established a great advantage is, you know, you understand the fish behavior so well when it comes to weekend, like the weekday to the weekend transition and how to like pattern them. And if you're just starting out, that's a huge advantage that they have against you where you need to learn like the fish that you have on a Thursday, Friday, how they're going to change when the weekend comes. Oh it's yeah. Huge. I mean, they just, in my opinion, that place is absolutely the worst. They mm -hmm. just clam up. I mean, I've caught three, seven pounders in the same day down there on like a Thursday and you get to Saturday. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't, they just, they're big for a reason. You know, they hear all the jet skis and idiots and, you know, they just go, yeah, I don't think so. You know, it's, uh, is that, is that Creek? Do you know of another Creek in the country that is that hot and gets that much pressure in a tournament? Cause I thought like, okay, maybe you could say a choir or mad woman, but not the same thing as the chick. And then maybe Nutbush maybe would be another kind of example, but not, it's not like the pressure you get on the chick. It, in a big it's tournament. amazing to me that all these tournaments, I mean, guys go over there, load their live wells up, drive all the way over to Osborne, yes. and dump them off. I mean, 
How are there any fish left? It, it makes <laughs> no Chicago sense many. how it keeps pumping them out. It, 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 it boggles the mind. I was there last year. Um, I was trying to do some fun fishing, stupidly enough, when when the uh, Bass Open was finishing up, and it was insane the boat traffic there, and they were all oh. you're right. Like, it was just you're just pulling it out and dumping it in. Yeah, I mean, it's I I read somewhere, and this was like Texas that actually really cares about this stuff. They were they did a study, I think it was at Sam Rayburn, and they talked about the it was sort of the impact of tournament fishing, and they said, okay, every sanctioned event, and I guess they're a little bit stricter about who's allowed to fish a tournament there. There's not all these millions of clubs that just kind of go do whatever. But they said they figured that if every single tournament for a year, if every boat had a limit, it was something like 30,000 fish got weighed in. They estimated based on shocking that there's 2 million bass that live there. So the impact of tournaments is like their DNR says, it doesn't do anything. Doesn't matter. Mm. Fish might get conditioned, you know? Well, that... Or I would wonder about relocation though. Like, you know, you talked about like Nutbush or Matawoman or places like that where you have all the tournaments in. Oh, I mean, yeah. you, you now have a population of fish that oh, just yeah. live there. I mean, there's there's no question, like, you know, around Flat Creek and Nutbush, there's the winning bag of fish is right by the boat ramp. You know, I mean, it's the same thing around Okanichi, you know. Um that doesn't mean you're gonna make them bite, you know it's just all there is to it. You know, I think there's a lot of fish that probably see your lures that are going, Nope. <laughs> you know, <laughs> unless you're one of these Japanese anglers. <laughs> yeah. That's all, you know, somebody always figures them out. You know, I mean, that's why I say, you know, I was talking to one of my, my good friends, Jason Houchins, you know, down at Bugs Island and he's a big stick down there. And he, you know, I said, what do you think? 45 pounds. And he said, oh, man, that's going to be tough. You know, mm. you know, I think that one or two guys will be able to figure it out, but I, you know, it's going to be like an 18, a 12 and a 13, you know what I mean? Why did they do it? That's what, I don't know why it just seems so random. They've gone to the James river for the past 200 years. Like, why is it well, this they, year? They used to go to bugs all the time. Uh, you know? Yeah. I mean, but why now? You know what I mean? I don't know. What I mean, politics happened? <laughs> yeah. I think chamber of commerce, from what I, from what I understand, they pay them. Like they get fees. Like I know that Bedford County Chamber of Commerce, when they had the elite series there, they were paying them to come, you know, hmm. like they were getting a big fee, like Bassmaster was getting paid to go there, you know? And I think there's sort of a regime change and everybody said, well, we're not paying these goofballs a hundred thousand dollars to come here. The economic impact isn't that great, you know? That will be interesting to see if as we get into this recession, how that's going to change where does that mean bass is just going to go to the same like seven stops every year if no one else is going to pay them? Because I, from a competition standpoint, I'm sorry, like I just don't want to see you guys on the same lakes at the same time of year every single freaking year. Can we please adjust a little bit? It's oh, so yeah. Boring. I mean, you know, I how, how like we have problems with that, like the, the, the federation that I fish. It's like, guys, can, look, let's go to the Rappahannock. You know, let's do Ooh, something yeah. different. I It's one of the reasons why I don't fish Fountainhead anymore. I got to the point where I felt like I'd seen it all, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like you're doing this every two weeks. It's sort of like I'm my my, my brain needs to be stimulated a little bit more. It, it, it's bo- it will get boring. Like if you fish the same place over and over again, but then from a professional standpoint, it's like on two sides. One, I think it's not as much fun to watch. The second is you keep giving an advantage to the people that have been there. Versus the new guys that are up and coming. It's like, well, how are you going to beat a guy that's been to Hartwell, you know, the first oh. weekend of March, the past 30 years, like he has an advantage built in than the guy coming up. you got to mix it up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like the Knoxville classic, you know, I mean, I don't think that fishery's all that great, you know, and I, I would rather I see the guys catching big fish, you know, I'd rather see it at Gunnersville, you know, or Gunnersville's just an example of a place, you know, you can see the hill. Yeah. I like, mean, at least MLF did that right, where they at least went yeah. to someplace new. I mean, yeah. with, with, with all of their issues, like those, those couple of lakes in the Carolinas, never literally heard of them until they went there. Cool. Yeah. It, Falls, Jordan. I mean, yeah. My, my, the guy I fished at Smith Mountain Lake a lot with was just down at Falls. And, and he was like, he, he actually 
during the BFL, he was like, man, I, I'm going to get the hell away from this lake. And he went down to falls and nobody was there. He's like, oh my God, I killed him. That's I'm awesome. like, yeah, smart. <laughs> you, you, yeah. Cause if you, if you just got dropped here and you got to look at this, you'd think there's only six lakes in the country because it's always the same six lakes. And oh, just, yeah, I don't I, know. Well, I mean, that's like, you know, my, my buddies go up to New York to smallmouth fish every year for like a week. And I, I just, my problem is, is that with all the weekend fishing that I do, I have a family vacation, you know, I have, you know, time together that I can't, I can't yeah, sacrifice no. that time to go up to New York to smallmouth fish. And I mean, as cool as that is, you know, it, it's, that's a fantasy world for what, I think fishing in some of these tougher places make you a better fisherman. You know, I mean, going and catching five fish at Bugs Island in a BFL, it's not easy, you know, and you better be sharp to do it because you're not going to get that many opportunities. Well, and that's what you. I miss. That's what I miss about the old Forest Wood Cup when you had a place in July or August. Like that was fun to watch those guys grind. Or oh, yeah. when yeah. the bass had the COVID year and they had to go to the same places, but it was in September, October. Yeah. And it's like, that was cool. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, th I think, I think the, the grinded out events is probably changed just simply because of, you know, live, live scope has really opened up. It's like bugs Island, you know, you get down there in September, like we got another two day coming up and oh my God, man, whew, you know, I'm a shallow water guy. It's, it's, it's a nail biter every time, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not catching 30. I promise you. You know, I mean, it's, uh, that, that's, that's where I think some of the, the old heads get really grouchy. Cause it's sort of like, ah, they're using this new technology. And it's like, well, you know, they, they have to appeal to a younger group, you know, and those places are so effing awful that time of year. Good luck. The fish are suspended. They're beat up. They've seen every lure that there is. You know, you know, going, I can promise you going and dragging a Carolina rig, you know, especially without electronics, good luck. You, mm -hmm. you know, you might catch a couple, you know, but it's uh, they, they definitely, it, it's fun too. You know, I, I kind of like not knowing, you know, I go out and just kind of give it hell for a day and, you know, it's good. I think it's good exercise. You know, you're pulling full and motor up, you're running around, you're, <laughs> You know, so I'm sweating by the end of the day, mm -hmm. man. I mean, I'm, I'm working hard, you know, and uh, I, I think that, you know, some of these guys, you know, it's not the Potomac, you know, where you're going to go to a grass bed and sit there all day long and never fire your motor up again. I mean, you got to you got to yeah. be on it, <laughs> you know, it's boring. It's so boring. I, I don't know. I get giddy when I get to go to like a, a new lake because that that way of fishing is just so monotonous and dumb after a while. I don't know how people do it every weekend to go fish the Potomac. Just like I don't care if you're good at it or not. Just like yeah, just oh, the boredom tr of it. Trust like, me. Trust me. You know, like my team partner is a guide on that river. Mm -hmm. And Tommy, you know, Tommy has to have places to go for clients to catch a fish. Okay. And then there's, okay, you want to win the tournament, we got to go to this spot, you know, and I'll never forget one last year where we were really struggling in this one creek, but there were big ones in there. We had four really nice fish. It had been hours since we had caught a fish. And I'm like, Tommy, I'm like, dude, one fit, like 14, 15 pounds had been getting a check. We were pretty close with four. And I'm like, dude, we can't stay here anymore. We've been here for two days. And I'm like, there, we, I haven't had a bite in a million years. We have got to go get one more fish. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. We, we ran over to Matta Woman and we went, you know, in front of the ramp over there. I call it the penalty box. <laughs> and I literally <laughs> caught one in like five seconds on a Cinco. And I'm like, okay, now we can go back to trying to fish, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But I just, I can't, you know, those are grinder events too. You know, you, especially, you know, if you're like me and you, you know, you're using a flipping stick a lot, you're not going to get a million bites, you know. Does he guide full time or is that a part time thing? And then he has another job too. He, he guides full time. He guides full time now. Yep. All right. Yeah. I got to have to get him on the show too then. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. I'll try. I'm going to see him in a, in a couple of weeks. I'll try to convince him. How did you two meet? Tommy uh, used to work at uh, 
uh, well, it was Galleons, and then it became Dick's Sporting Goods. And, uh, you know, just got to know him over the years. You know, Tommy's a good guy. He's pretty soft spoken though. He doesn't he doesn't talk a lot. So I think it might it might be tough, you know. And, and then, did, so did you ever think about guiding ever? Uh, if I, I wouldn't want to do it for bass fishing, I, I I would definitely consider it for saltwater fishing. That would be fun. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are very successful. I've got some friends at, at the Outer Banks and uh, Southwest Florida that do well. You know, I mean, they they the 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 vacation time of year down there those guys are killing it they make they make good money you know um but it's like anything that has to be your job Mm -hmm. you know and you know i think anything that becomes your job becomes not as fun you know i have fun bass fishing but it's work (laughs) you know it's hard work do you have to enjoy teaching people and watching other people have catch fish like yeah with, Absolutely. With, with all the guides I have on here every month to talk about the places, the one through line is like, you know, I enjoy watching a person catch their first PR, whatever it is. And, and like, cause you're not the center of the attention necessarily when you're guiding day in and yeah. day out. And that, yeah. that's hard to have that personality. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the guides work hard to find yes. these fish and Tommy is out in all sorts of conditions to find the fish. You know, that doesn't guarantee success, especially at a tournament level, but you know, you have to appreciate the hard work and I, and I, and I give him a lot of credit for that. And, you know, as a, having a team tournament partner, you know, we really fish the Potomac together. I can't, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and take credit for that. I mean, shit, he knows where to go. You know, that's, that's 90% of it, you know, and you know, I'll be the first one to say, you know, I've, I've thanked him and, you know, BFLs. I mean, you're, you know, Tommy and I team fish together. There's no rule being broken. You know, you know, he's, this just happens to be what he does, you know, and, you know, some of that success is definitely from, you know, knowing where to go, you know, but we, you know, we, we, we've, we've helped each other a lot too, you know, so but now, there's definitely, there's definitely, yeah, you know, Charlie. You had Charlie Taylor on. I actually used to work for Charlie Taylor when he worked at Sports Authority like a million really? years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Charlie will tell you. You know, just ninety percent of it is just knowing where to go. You know, it, it is. It is, and it's just I don't know. There's always going to be drama about that stuff, but it, as long as you're not breaking rules and things like that, because again, like I mean, if you're paying some- for information, it's it's a rule. You know, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, sorry, I've fished Potomac teams with Tommy for 20 years. You know, I mean, that just happens to be his occupation. The thing is that you understand most of what he's, he's, he's taking people on crappy trips. He's doing snakehead fishing. You know, he's also bass fishing. He kind of mixes in. His things I mean, together. shit, the snakehead thing is probably more secretive than, uh, than a bass spot. I would re- reckon trying to get a guy to come on and talk about the snakehead stuff. Holy crap. It's like really? trying to get, oh yeah. They are I, super secret. I, Tommy and I, we went into Chickamauga and I caught seven snakeheads last year. And I was like, we, we were, and I was like, dude, this isn't a guide trip for snakeheads. <laughs> oh, dude. Like, yeah, I, I had one guy possibly to come on the show and he said, like, I can't tell you, I can't even tell you like the Potomac River is a place you can catch them. It is so super secret, these places, because, you know, everyone wants to go in there and, and eat them. And so to catch a dragon is what they call them, which is a big one. It, it's, it's getting harder on, in these areas, but everyone wants to know how to catch them, but no one is willing to say like, like they exist. It's so, it's so weird how, how protective snakehead anglers are those things. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, the seven that I caught that day were kind of small ones, you know, two, three pounders, but you know, God, I caught one on a Cinco last year it was probably 12 pounds. Dude, that's nice. You know, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I just throw them back. I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, what are you going to do? I, th- I think there's still a lot of them out there. There really yeah. is. I, I don't know. People are complaining, but you know, that's, that's a whole nother topic for another day. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I caught seven. I mean, there's plenty of snakeheads. I promise you. There's nothing more annoying than catching them punching mats, too. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know immediately. You know, oh, yeah. as soon as you flip it in there, they're on it. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's 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 like you know, 
catching a four. I've caught several blue catfish in mats too recently, which is even more hmm. annoying. Those yeah. things are more of a problem than snakeheads. Yeah, like that's. Uh, I mean, I think it's a it's a multiple things. I think it's why the vegetation is not growing there. That's the more important thing versus snakehead or blues. Is like why are we losing so much subaquatic vegetation in places? Like yeah. Yeah, like you get around. I caught seven blue catfish in a row off of a dock uh, up in D.C. last year. Seven mm. in a row, and I probably could have caught 50. Wow. Every time I threw my jig under the dock, you could feel them kind of batting it around. It was unbelievable. That's, we just had – um, yeah, it's so funny because we just had Cat Daddy on, who's the one of the only charters, catfish charters, actually. I yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah. I, I know who he is. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting to, to hear. Just I want to get like their take on things, and and one thing is he just thinks it's the commercial fishing is the number one worst thing, actually for the river. Period. End of story. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a political and, conversation because you know we've got video pictures of what they're doing, and it's you know that, no, that nobody seems to, to care or want to do anything about it so <clears> yeah know, i have a it. i have a call into the chesapeake bay association to hopefully find a person to come on the show and talk about that because i've had enough people come on and say like i need to talk about the commercial fishing issue and it's a big problem well i mean it's no it's no secret you know that you know it's like the menhaden you know yeah. I mean, sharks don't have food to eat so they are now on the beaches all over the place mm -hmm. you know i mean what, what i mean i don't know it's from what i from what i've heard a lot of it is these cat food companies you know that are catching menhaden and bait fish shad whatever and that's a big ingredient in cat food so that's I mean, what i've heard yeah but i mean the shark thing is also that we just haven't been culling the shark population like we used to and i don't care about all this bullshit we're not killing a trillion sharks per year because yeah i'm not bad i'm not good at math but if you killed a trillion sharks a year there would be no sharks left it, it's that yeah. there's more of them <laughs> yeah it's it's funny to me like if you go to the beach like and i have one of those big hatteras heaver rods you will catch a shark i promise you you know doing that off the beach down in the outer banks throw a fish head or something out there there's a lot of them and it's it's kind of scary to me because you know when you you have a, a kid or something that's right in the surf where i i go i go as far down on the hatteras point as you can go and there's a couple you know i call them they're just sort of i guess they call them sloughs or whatever they're deep spots right off the oh my god man i've seen some big ones like right on the friggin' beach you know, and I don't know if they're bull sharks or, or what, but man, it's never saw that. And I, and I kind of grew up surfing down there, believe it or not, and uh, never saw them. Oh, the, now they're all over the place. The one time I decided to try to, we try, tried surfing down in Florida and I got my board bumped and I came back in. I'm like, I'm not doing this again. It's the eeriest feeling oh. to see a six footer just, just bump your board and swim under it. I'm like, Fuck no. <laughs> we're, we're yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if you, uh, if you're familiar with the outer banks, the, the Bonner bridge, which is, uh, the big, the Oregon inlet bridge that mm -hmm. goes across, I'll never forget one morning, uh, I was down there and like, you used to be able to climb down these in between the abutments and you could get down there and we, that's where I cut my teeth, sheep's head fishing. And I was down there and the tide was right up at the edge of the thing. And I mean, like an eight or 10 foot shark literally swam right by me. Oh, and you God, look out man. on that flat and there are guys out <sighs> no. there wade fishing and water that's murky, you know, to be honest with you. And I'm just, hell no. Oh my nope. God. I'm like, no way. No, I'm no. Mm -mm. You know, at least it's like Southwest Florida. Like it's crystal clear. If one, you could see one coming like out mm. there. No way. No, I, Oh God, no. I'll, a, a funny story is of a guy I used to fish a lot with. We took my ranger out in the Albemarle Sound out there <laughs> and uh, got stuck on a sand flat. The, the difference is in places like that, and you know, if it's all the bass boaters that might want to try that. The flats that we can run over on the Potomac and the jams are mud, so you can run right through them. Not oh, out God, there. No. It's sand. Oh, God, so you, no. You effing stop. <laughs> I have a picture on my on my computer he took of me in my underwear pulling the boat off this flat and he the story with that is he's like man what do you see that there's like a fish or something over there on the, we're in the middle of the fucking ocean basically in a ranger 
and I and, it, and I'll turn around. I'm like, oh my god, that's a shark, and it's a big one. <laughs> you know, here we are in a in a Ranger 518 stuck on a sand flat in the mouth of the Oregon Inlet. Like, not something mm. you're going to see every day. Oh God, no, hell no! There I'll are... never, I'll never take my bass boat out there again. But it was, uh, I've done it a few times. Oh, dude, Todd. I mean, again, I know we're running <laughs> up on it here. I, I'll, I, I, I'll, I appreciate your time, man. It's n- been fun. No, I'm. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Is there anything that you want? You want to? You want to pump any sponsors? Or anything like that? Uh, you know, uh, maybe thank Mayor Marine. They've been very good to me you know, dealing with, with Phoenix and, uh, uh, I'll, I'll mention Falcon rods. They've done a little bit for me, but, uh, no, no real sponsors or anything. It's just, I'm at a, I'm at a point in my life where that's not really, not really where I'm going with this, <laughs> but, uh, Hey, if there's anybody out there that wants to give me some money and some product, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm down for that. But, uh, well, you know, I you like could... to, I like to feel like I can hold my own at least in the regional level. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but, uh, it's a, it's a social media and digital kind of age. And I don't, I don't know that I really qualify for that. <laughs> it so. is, but you know, thanks again for just coming on, sharing some stories and, and letting people get to know you a little bit better. Again, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, including his socials and all of the list of his sponsors, please like, and subscribe to the channel. We are the fastest growing fishing show in the greater DMV area. We'll see you next time. I'm fishing. Cool. The DMV. Thank you, Bye. Thomas. Appreciate it, man. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.